Hello, Earthlings. It's nice to see you. Um, I also want to thank Leah and Adam and Gwen and all of the staff. Um, this is a really beautiful conference and I offer my gratitude and my congratulations also. Um, thank you, B, for the ride in your groovy van. And thank you, Chelsea, for continuing to pour me drinks at the bar, even though I forget my cup every single night. Um, thank you also to the University of the South for making space for us here on this beautiful campus. Can everybody hear me okay? No? No? Or yes? Okay, now it's good. All right, so I want to um, begin with just a few qualifications about what I'm about to say, one of which is I forgot my glasses in my bag. Um, the first is that this, no, don't, it's, don't get them, it's, it's fine. Um, <laughs> that wasn't a cry for help, it was an admonishment to myself. Um, the first is that this is a draft and it is literally a very first draft. It is called, the file is called Trauma Talk One. Um, which I have been writing here in my hotel room at the inn in, since I arrived on Monday and um, up until 4.30 in the morning last night. Um, and because it is a draft, you are the very first people that I'm sharing it with. Um, and so please know that I'm feeling very vulnerable, vulnerable about it and also and disgusted and horrified by its very many flaws. I'm especially horrified by all the ways in which it is incomplete. I'm gonna be talking about trauma and specifically about personal trauma and my talk will include frank discussions of the psychological effects of sexual and domestic violence. I fully and completely understand if you are not in the headspace for that. And I wanna give you my blessing and permission if you realize if at any time you feel that this isn't what you wanna be hearing and you feel you need to leave. I too am not in the right headspace to be present for this. <laughs> I've been working on this talk over the past few days and um, it has been triggering for my own trauma. I've had nightmares almost every night. I've had intrusive thoughts. My skin prickles even now with the electric memory of vigilant fear. In the future, I plan to expand this talk to include collective or historical traumas, but I have not been able to access the reserves of mental clarity I would need to integrate those into this talk and therefore outside the scope of today's consideration. I ask for your grace and forbearance on that matter. This is why I need my glasses. I lost my place. Um, and I invite you to, th so I ask for your grace and forbearance that this does, is not uh, comprehensive or inclusive of every kind of trauma there is. Um, and I want to invite you to think with me in the coming days about the ways that my arguments can be made more expansive. That said, I wanna acknowledge that personal trauma is not unique to me, that there are many forms of trauma, that many forms of violence, and that trauma can also take the form of inequity. I am mindful of what a privilege it is to be able to stand here. I want to acknowledge that this privilege was made possible by the work of those who have come before. I very much hope my talk today honors them and all of us here today and those of us who will come after. Given where this talk is going to go, I do want to begin with a moment of celebration and I promise we will come back to this moment at the end. Um, almost exactly eight years ago, as of last week, I was a guest at a different conference, kind of like this, but not as good as this, um, at Reed College in Portland. Tin House was publishing my second book, a memoir called The Other Side. I got up in front of the audience at an outdoor amphitheater and read from it for almost the very first time. Uh, Sarah was there. There you are. You were there. Um, I'm glad you're here again. Um, I don't want to assume that you know who I am or have any familiarity whatsoever with my work. So if you don't know the other side, I should tell you that it is a memoir about the memory of how when I was 21 years old, my ex-boyfriend kidnapped and raped me 
and tried but failed to kill me. He got away and I got away. He is a fugitive living in Venezuela and I am now myself, a person who writes books. But at that time, on that day in Portland, Oregon, I was a woman who was coming for the first time out of almost a decade of hiding, of living in fear that at any point that man might show up wherever I was and shoot me with a gun. I was afraid of saying something publicly for the first time that for so long had felt completely impossible to articulate in any way at all. <laughs> In the years since I've often, oh, in the years since, I've often been asked about trauma, and some of my thoughts and responses to those questions are collected here. <sighs> my nose is running. I'm not actually upset, and I don't have COVID. I tested. <laughs> um, but to be perfectly honest, I had already been thinking about trauma for many years, even before that book came out. It's not an exaggeration to say trauma has been on my mind, and my mind has been shaped by it for over 20 years. To talk about trauma, we need to talk about memory. In class yesterday, we were talking about memory, and I mentioned that memoir is the genre of memory. I think many of us tend to think that the subject of memoir is autobiography or an experience, an episode, a thing we did or went through, but the true subject of memoir is memory itself, at least in my view. When I first began researching into memory and how memory works, I was surprised to learn that from the perspective of researchers, there is no such thing as a memory. The mind is not, in fact, like a bag of marbles, though it sometimes may feel that way. Mine especially feels that way today. Rather, memory is narrative, a text, that is always being written and rewritten in the act of remembering. It is telling, I think, that very few people have, have significant memories before the age of four or five. Um, there are, of course, exceptions, and whenever I trot that piece of research out, there's always somebody who tells me they remember being born. Um, but for the most part, our autobiographical memory begins when we learn to narrativize to tell a story and get the facts right, to know the difference between truth and fiction, to take note of details and to emphasize the parts of a story that others will consider interesting and to learn to omit, omit other parts. If you have ever spent any time speaking to a very young child, you may know that this is a skill that they do not immediately have. A very young child's stories include everything, every detail, every impression, every thought and digression and idea. The brain cannot store information like this. Memory needs us to choose what to remember and what to forget. Memory is, in other words, a vast and ever-shifting autobiographical narrative a fluid and flexible filing system, a highly organized and dynamic method for storing massive amounts of first-person narration. The sum total of the system is an ever-changing story about a singular and unique perspective, which in memory research and discussion is sometimes divided into three levels. And this is what we were talking about yesterday. There are lifetime periods, which refer to extended periods periods in a person's life, general events, which are thematically related knowledge and event-specific knowledge. Each layer of this structure provides cues and pathways that allow access to other layers, so that accessing a specific lifetime period, such as how we used to wash our groceries at the beginning of the pandemic, provides access to associated general events. Oh, excuse me. The lifetime period as the early days of the pandemic, associated general events, such as how we used to wash our groceries, which in turn provides access to specific images and sensations, such as the one time I found myself windexing an orange. It's this last layer with all its specificity where we learn to cultivate storytelling as writers. But unlike a written document, in the human mind, specific details often have no material referent. So over time, some details fall away and are lost. They drift and change. The orange becomes a cucumber. 
while new ones continue to form. Forgotten knowledge can be recalled. New interpretations can alter established memories, and that knowledge, those stories, can be tailored to our changing needs. Memory means not only the power of the mind to remember things, but also the mind itself. Insofar as it is regarded as the total sum of the things we remember. I do not necessarily mean any specific recollection, remembrance, impression, or reminiscence, but rather the relationship or association among impressions, sensory perceptions, and thoughts that, arrived, uh, that arise out of lived experience. Human memory is relational and fallible, and it is not so much an accurate accounting of events as it is a set of processes by which we encode, store, and retrieve information. Remembering, much like writing, is an interpretive and creative act. The characters, their voices, the content of their speech, the set and the setting, all of these are supplied by the external world, but we each have something at stake in what we select and hold in the mind, even if, it, even if that isn't something we consciously decide. We all have a self-authoring mind who binds impressions to moments and assigns them meaning, and in doing so gives them lasting form. Over time, remembering moves these autobiographical, nar autobiographical narratives to short-lived categories. This is a little bit about how the brain works. Your memories actually get stored in different places in your mind. This process of converting short-term information to long-term memory for storage is called consolidation. And its main feature is the loss or forgetting of distracting information. It's no coincidence then that the word itself, memory, comes from Anglo-French, my French is atrocious, memory, I don't know, um, something written to be kept in mind from Latin memoria, a reminiscence from Old Norse, memir, the name of the giant who guards the well of wisdom and from Old English, mernon, to mourn. But a traumatic memory, I learned, works differently. In traumatic experiences, stress hormones trigger a narrowing of your consciousness. It's as if your brain stops making a text file and begins making a movie. Recording every smell, every taste, every detail of the room, the temperature, the time of day. This makes the traumatic memory more engorged with sensation and perception than other memories, which means it gets treated differently by the brain and stored in a completely different place. It is detached from normal memory. Normal memory. This detachment can take many forms, including amnesia, which may last for hours, weeks, or years, dissociation, which refers to a compartmentalization or fracturing of experience, or the memory may completely lack a semantic component, which is to say it's nonverbal. It resists language. Any experience that resists language also necessarily resists narrative, and without narrative, the traumatic um, experience exists separately from the rest of our autobiographical self, though it often intrudes into consciousness as terrifying perceptions, obsessional preoccupations, and anxiety reactions. Without a narrative, the experience cannot be integrated into the fabric of memory, which is not to say it is not remembered but that the remembered trauma enters a liminal realm where it is both acknowledged and unacknowledged, part of you and not part, perhaps even indefinitely. To quote myself for a moment, there are some things I just don't know, I wrote in my memoir, and other things I just can't say, which is not a failure of memory, but of language. How's everybody doing? Good, you good? Okay, so that's dense memory stuff. We're moving on um, to trauma stuff. On a journey. <clears throat> it occurs to me that I have not yet defined what I mean by trauma. When I say trauma, I mean an experience that wounds the body or threatens to 
and the wound is so severe and so overwhelms our capacity to process or meaningfully respond that it also wounds the mind. Where there should be language or smell or sound, there is instead only an open mouth with its tongue cut out. A long hallway of doors that are all unlocked, thrown open, beyond the thresholds are rooms in your own mind in which your ghost haunts you. These are places you do not want to look. A trauma might form from an experience of interpersonal violence or state violence, of witnessing a death or many deaths, of seeing photographs of bodies piled into shallow graves, of seeing one body uncovered for hours on the sidewalk in the heat of summer, but of, see one, of seeing no one cover it or mourn of having no space or time to grieve one trauma before the next one arrives to make fragments of time and language and ourselves. And what we lose in the trauma becomes impossible to retrieve. We experience without moving our own exile. Trauma is the toll of surviving mortal peril. We become alienated from one another, from the places we live, from our own experience of the events that have unfolded because experience requires narrative and narrative requires language. But what language exists to make meaning of trauma when trauma becomes less like an event with a beginning and ending and more like a tide? It ebbs and flows. Our relationship to the world erodes as it arrives and arrives and arrives. I am saying that trauma is an increasingly shared and chronic condition, which is not to say that trauma is in any way particularly modern or new. In psychiatric terms, the condition is post-traumatic stress disorder, which first appeared in the DSM-3 in 1980. As one of the new diagnoses, PTSD was classified as a subcategory of anxiety disorders, a stress response precipitated by a catastrophically traumatic event that was, quote, outside the range of usual human experience. This diagnosis, PTSD, was the result of decades of the combined efforts of researchers, social workers, and psychiatrists to describe a combination of symptoms particularly, uh, particular to combat veterans. Its inclusion in the DSM was considered a watershed event, whereas shell shock had long been considered a weakness of the individual to handle the rigors of war. For the first time, experts acknowledged that a trauma response was not the result of some pathology in the individual, but in fact, a normal reaction to a pathological experience. But even in 1980, the idea of trauma wasn't new. Before PTSD, the condition this term describes had gone by many other names. Hysteria, soldier's heart, irritable heart, railway spine, traumatic neuroses, fright neuroses, disorderly action of the heart, neurocirculatory asthenia, Shell shock, war neuroses, war hysteria, stress response syndrome, combat stress reaction, concentration camp syndrome, war sailor syndrome, war, excuse me, Vietnam veterans syndrome. Centuries before, before Freud introduced the idea of neuroses, Swiss physician Johannes Hofer, writing in 1688, used the term nostalgia to describe a set of symptoms among soldiers similar to paranoia except instead of seeing danger everywhere, the sufferer was manic with longing for home, he said, a place that had been changed by war and irretrievably lost, a past to which they could never return. Um, I'm gonna skip this part. With this history in mind, it has been surprising to me to open several magazines lately and discover pronouncements from certain literary critics named Prabhul Sagal that trauma is so very over. In one of her first pieces at her new job at the New Yorker, she declared a moratorium on the so-called trauma plot, 
dismissing it as a lazy convention, a sleight of hand to shift our attention away from the tension of the future, while plot asks us what will happen to these characters. In her view, trauma sends us looking toward the mysteries of the past. What happened to these characters to make them this way? The notion of trauma has proved all engulfing, she writes. Once defined as an event, quote, outside the range of usual human experience, trauma now encompasses, and this is Seagal's quote, anything the body perceives as too much, too fast, or too soon. Novels, films, television shows are all guilty of what she calls trauma creep. If anything and everything is a trauma, she seems to be saying, then nothing is. Does trauma have to be unique or solitary to be painful? She might be bored of trauma, but I'm not yet ready to throw it away. And this might be because I'm not defining trauma in the abstract as a critic witnessing the disappointment of a shallow climactic revelation, but rather as a person who lives with trauma as the real and catastrophic consequence of surviving what was very nearly my own death. Trauma is not, as Seagal suggests, a passport to status. Earlier, I defined it as a wound, but if you look inside the word trauma, you will find an older word that means to rub, to turn, a word related to drilling, to piercing, to making detours, that means to the detriment, a thread, a threshold, a tribulation, and importantly, a turn. In the days and weeks after the kidnapping, I felt shock and terror, and then I sort of went numb. And for months, I felt almost nothing at all. It was important to me that people understand that I was turning out just fine. I thought that if I went on with my life and pretended that nothing had happened, maybe I could convince myself that it didn't. I went to grad school for poetry and one of the first books I remember reading, which began turning my thinking about what was and wasn't possible with relation to trauma, was Teresa Hak Kyung Cha's Dictae. If you don't know this book, please go out and buy it, because you should. But for our purposes today, what I'll say about it is that it's a book that is looking everywhere for language to describe a violence that has none. She looks to lyric and epic poetry, autobiography, translation, catechism, and historical narrative. Her speaker, who she sometimes calls, um, the dis another French word is called the disuse, um, which is uh, used for a professional reciter, as in recitation. Um, her speaker channels various women throughout history who have been the objects of cultural and political fantasy. The Nine Muses, Korean nationalist martyr Yu Guan Sun. Saint Therese of Lisieux and Joan of Arc, whose voices enter the disuse from without. The opening image of the book is of graffiti scrawled by Korean coal miners. It translates to, mother, I miss you, I am hungry, I wanna go home. This multiplicity of voices joins with photographs, epigraphs, graffiti, correspondences, confessions which do not confess, inaccurately attributed quotes, and unfaithfully translated dictae, which recur throughout the text as profoundly unlocatable events. And they protect the I by hiding her in their unlocatability. When the reader is most sure of an identifiable I in the text, Often when we are closest to locating a self, a speaking self, who is witnessing, testifying, Cha turns the conventions of confession against themselves to challenge the ideological assumption, assumptions inherent in the reader's certainty. As if to say, did you see what you did just there, that person you wanted me to be? Most relevant for my purposes, Cha writes throughout the book about the literal physical difficulty of forcing the tongue to speak in the oppressor's language, of the impossibility of expression in a language where every word has come to mean one's own annihilation. I read Dictae in a summer course after my first year of graduate school 
It had been three years since I had been kidnapped, which maybe sounds like a long time. But looking back now, three years is both an eternity and it is no time at all. All my poems, because I was a poet then, um, were about this trauma that I couldn't say and I couldn't not say. I think now I was drawn to the forms of poetry because it seemed the right vehicle for trauma. Poetry permits fragments, non-linear structure. It permits silence and rupture. It requires neither logic nor reason and is held together by associative leaps between disparate images. It was, at that time, the most accurate language I could find to describe a violence that had none. As I was preparing this talk, I came across one of the poems that I wrote during that time. Do you want me to read it? Okay, don't judge me. There is a reason I am not a poet anymore. Okay, um, so this poem is called Landscapes, which is interesting um, because last night at dinner, Tarfia and I were talking about the Claudia Rankin quote, by landscape, I also mean memory, which by the way, is from plot. Um, so this is landscapes. You're the world, I said, and it was March, raining. I rubbed my hands to make fire. You were wet with the thrill of snow. I was with loss. We all have our seasons. You've got the breeze of hands up Sunday's dress, the blue shirt I left. I've got bruises, the lure of sleep. Also, each night's dream rattling the halls of my stomach. I've got one dry inch of sheet. You're the world, I said, and you stopped on the steps, pressed your hands once together, the pose the prayer. Once you gave me mouthfuls of saffron, now grown silent as stars. You gathered handfuls of earth and rain and my body without asking. Now I need consequences. But I get to be the forest you wander in, a lake touched by the frost, each edge of sky sharpening the cracks I get to be the fog, the last leaf slipping, the rub of your thumb and finger, and like that, I'm gone. I read this poem not because of what it articulates or succeeds in articulating, but because of what I think it utterly fails to. If baby Lacey brought this poem to me, the middle aged Professor Lacey, I would say, what the hell is this poem even about? The absence of an identifiable occasion or problem or subject wasn't a conscious and writerly choice, rather it was a psychological one. This was during the time when I couldn't yet admit to myself that I had been changed. Though it was the beginning of me trying to say there was some kind of cleaving into a before and after, into a physical version of myself who was technically fine, I suppose, because I had no lingering injury to my body I could point to. Rather, the injury I felt was what Hoffer might describe as nostalgia, a manic longing for a past to which I could never possibly return. What time, how are we doing on time? When I talk about this cleaving, I am describing what I now know experts call dissociation, which is an enduring effect of terror and a common symptom of PTSD. Dissociation is a form of self-preservation or self-protection. It is also a reflex, a response. It is innate and instinctual, and at the time, I didn't know how else to be if I wanted to go on being. It was a way of becoming less vulnerable to the world in order to survive it, but it also felt terribly lonely at the time, and it feels lonely still. When I married and started a family, and as my life actually started to get pretty great, I wanted to feel happy, but instead felt paralyzed by a fear so intense that I sometimes couldn't leave the house. 
I knew that more than anything else, I wanted to change my relationship to the experiences I felt in my body, but could not point to or narrate or name. This is around the time that I started teaching a poetry workshop in a transitional shelter for women as part of a service learning course. My faculty supervisor at the time directed me towards several volumes on recovery writing in an effort to prepare me to respond to the women's writing. And this was actually a very instructive place for my research on these issues to begin. For one thing, I discovered that I really strongly objected to the, all the rhetoric about how writing about trauma could, in effect, make a person whole again. It took years to articulate why this sentiment bothered me, but eventually I realized that it reinforces what I consider to be a flawed notion that after some kind of trauma, that a person is somehow broken. After a trauma, a person may feel some part of them has been shattered. That metaphor certainly describes the emotional state of the traumatized person. But the fact is, every person, even a profoundly traumatized one, is already whole, has always been whole. Thought patterns change, as do behaviors and associations. And perhaps most difficult of all, what changes is the story that person tells themselves about the person they are and have been and can be. Of course, I didn't know all this at the time or couldn't articulate this when I began the research, but over the years, that research continued into medical journals and history books, Greek mythology and neuroscience, quantum physics and literature. I began to realize that the fact there was no story I could tell myself about what had happened to me was what made the experience feel so traumatic for so many years. When I set out to write the other side, it wasn't to fix myself or to make myself whole again, but to give myself a story to tell about who I, went, who I was, who I am, and who I still could be. In the memoirs of writers like Teresa Hakim Cha, I found company. In Sarah Manguso's Two Kinds of Decay, her search for adequate language to describe the trauma of sudden and life-altering illness, I felt less alone in my own search for language. I realized as I read Audre Lorde's Zami and Maxine Hong Kingston's Woman Warrior and Gloria Anzaldúa's Borderlands La Frontera and Art Spiegelman's Mouse that I was not the first person to ask questions in a world wiped clean of answers. And I wasn't walking the path alone. One book that was particularly instructive for me was Lydia Yuknovich's 2011 memoir, Chronology of Water in which she relates the fact of her father's abusive violence, but always keeps that violence obscured from our view. We see its effects, the long shadow it casts into her life, her relationships, even onto her daughter's death. She finds refuge as a child in swimming, and as an adult and a writer, she builds a refuge and for herself and others around this metaphor of water with her words. The book is so candid, so radically honest and painful that at the time I didn't fully understand, but I've since come to appreciate how important it was to me that she withheld the descriptions of that violence. In her 2015 Guernica essay, Woven, after describing her ex-husband's attempt to murder her, she writes, quote, in America, it's tricky to describe violence without turning it into entertainment. I've spoken elsewhere about the importance of candor, of frankness, of finding whatever language you need to tell the truth about yourself, uh, to tell the truth to yourself about your life and to hold nothing back. I am convinced there is healing in that. But there is a difference between the writing you do for yourself, which can be therapy and almost always therapeutic, and the writing you do for others, which is craft. It is also important to remember that there are those who will always have an appetite for your suffering, and you are under no obligation to feed them. They are, in fact, insatiable. I want to read you um, one of the hardest sections to write in the book. Um, so this is a version of the scene. <clears throat> 
Um, at first, I have a bot. Uh, excuse me, let me start over. Everybody still doing okay? Okay, thank you. Thank you for being here. At first, I have a body, a wild animal body I throw and thrash against his cage. I almost break a limb before he catches me in his hands. I growl and hiss and bare my teeth. But then my body is not a wild animal body. It is a human girl body. The two arms pinned across, the two legs spread a tomb. It's the mind that goes thrashing so wildly. The body remains calm. The body undresses and lays itself down. But the mind goes thrashing so wildly. The body lays itself down on a clear plastic sheet, hears but does not listen to the soup of human-like speech boiling in its ears, spilling exactly the length and width of the room. The mind skitters safely out of reach. The body lays itself down, but does not know with precision in which direction or at what point, if any, in the future it will rise and go. Or even if it will be physically possible, the future having maybe splintered the body into a thousand wet shining shards. Underneath, bedrock unbuckles with the thrust of vast tectonic plates, skidding at this very moment over an ocean of white-hot magma in the body's every orifice. But the mind goes thrashing. The mind goes thrashing away from the body, which does not move a muscle, does not move an inch from the spot in which it is unraveling, will be unraveling, has been unraveling ever since. What worked for me in this scene, and I don't mean what worked for me in the workshop sense, in the sense of like, I liked this, it really worked for me. Um, I mean, what happened for me when I wrote this moment is that something clicked. I can't snap my fingers. Will you snap your fingers? You're really good at it. Thank you. No. Click. Thank you. I do not describe the violence itself because I did not want to turn my trauma into a spectacle for others' entertainment. When we write about the long shadow of violence and the action that cast it, we are talking about trauma. When we focus on the harm itself, when we describe every bruise and gash and meaty abrasion in stomach-churning detail, we are producing spectacle. Spectacle does nothing to address the trauma and in fact can often re-traumatize. It feeds the appetite of those who are insatiable. I gave my trauma language, even if it was figurative and elusive and their violence remains out of sight. And giving this trauma language transform it from a speechless horror into a thread I could weave into the fabric of autobiographical memory. A story I could tell about what happened to me and who it made me and who I am. The story itself is not traumatic to me. I can say I was kidnapped and raped by a man who tried to kill me, but I lived. I can say that, and I feel nothing about it. It's like saying I went to the grocery store and bought bread. That difference has changed my life in ways it might take a whole other talk to explain. I feel neutral about the sentence, about the fact of it, but this is not to say that the memory isn't painful. It is. I'm not suggesting that the memory goes away or the pain goes away or that by writing about a trauma we can make it disappear or that by writing about the worst experiences of our lives we can cure ourselves of despair. The reality is that trauma isn't as tidy as a narrative can be. The story I tell myself about who I am, my memory, is always changing. That is progress believe it or not. Before that day, eight years ago, at the amphitheater in Portland, I had been living a very small and frightened life, almost entirely in hiding from the man who kidnapped me, a person who is still at large to this day. 
I rarely published. I never published any of those poems, for example, mostly out of fear that doing so might endanger me and my family. But when the other side came out, I found myself welcomed by a loving community of writers who had some sense of what I was risking. Now, when I talk and write about trauma, I do so knowing that I am part of this loving community. The only reason I can stand here is because I feel myself embraced by love, and that being embraced by the love of others allows me to love myself in such a way that I can approach that pain from a, pace, a place of calm understanding that I am cared for in this world. It is what has allowed me to tell a story about myself in which my pain becomes a source of my power. I am grateful to be able to finally live my life in public. And when I said at the beginning of this talk that it is a privilege to be here, this is what I mean. That violence still casts a shadow over my life. I am standing fully in the darkness of it even now. But what I want to tell you is that the work of finding language to tell the story of it to myself and to you has given me a light. Thank you. I've heard that you don't do questions here. Is that right? Yep, okay, so goodbye. <laughs> <laughs>